So the title of the talk um, is the title of my most recent book, Power and Legitimacy, Reconciling Europe and the Nation State, uh, which was, thank you, uh, published by the Oxford University Press at the end of 2010. Uh, so indeed, uh, my principal aim tonight is to give you an overview of the thesis uh, I set out in Power and Legitimacy, which I think is timely in light of uh, recent events in the EU, notably the Eurozone crisis. Um, as I hope to elaborate a bit toward the end of my uh, talk tonight. But I'd also like to do a couple other things uh, as well, time permitting. Most importantly, I'd like to give you a few hints about the project that I'm working on here at the Academy this semester, uh, which involves exploring in greater historical depth uh, what I see as the parallel evolution of constitutional democracy and modern administrative governance in the North Atlantic world uh, over the course of the 19th and 20th centuries. Um, as I hope will become clear in this talk, uh, this new project is deeply intertwined with the thesis that I set out in Power and Legitimacy. Uh, in my view, the EU, um, as Ingolf suggested, is best understood as an extension of the forms of administrative governance that consolidated themselves on the national level in the decades after 1945, what I call the post-war constitutional settlement of administrative governance. This settlement, I argue, emerged out of growing tensions between two countervailing historical trends over the late 19th and early 20th centuries. On the one hand, there was the increased centralization of governing legitimacy in elected bodies and other nationally constituted institutions, plebiscitarian chief executives, as well as growing court systems. On the other hand, there was the diffusion and fragmentation of normative power away from these centralized constitutional bodies into an increasingly variegated administrative sphere operating at multiple levels. The growth of the modern administrative state in the um, uh, 19th and 20th century was driven by functional demands for regulation across a whole range of domains relating to urbanization, industrialization, as well as the movement of goods, labor, and capital, both within and beyond the nation state. Thus, despite our conventional images of national consolidation during this period, one could just as easily conclude, based on these countervailing pressures, that the late 19th and early 20th century European nation state, indeed the nation state throughout the North Atlantic world, was very much a leaky and porous vessel, to use the words of my fellow fellows Michael Geyer and Charlie Bright in a piece that they published together in 2002. It is precisely because of this administrative leakiness, if you will, that we should probably resist the temptation, which might be especially strong here in Germany, to equate administration with rigid hierarchies and bureaucratic centralization within the state, perhaps in a Weberian sense, as well as with, as well as with some kind of pouvoir neutre, or moral authority above social divisions, perhaps in the sense of a Hegelian generalist state. Indeed, when I speak of administrative governance wherever located, I am referring to the manifold instances of regulatory power that today reach well beyond the political summit of any state, that is the legislature or the executive in their highest constitutional forms. In my view, the administrative realm today not only encompasses the state bureaucracy at all its levels, but it also st stretches well beyond the boundaries of the state itself to international organizations like the WTO, or to regional entities like the EU or NAFTA. Thus, in my mind, European governance as a whole, including the seemingly legislative European Parliament and the seemingly judicial European Court of Justice, are best understood as an extension of the diffusion and fragmentation of regulatory power that has been the defining characteristic of the leaky container of the modern state. And thus, a central goal of European public law has been, in keeping with, again, what I call the post-war constitutional settlement, to reconcile the functional demands of integration, which has entailed the extensive migration of regulatory power to the supranational level, with the continued cultural attachment to ideals of representative government and constitutional democracy on the national level as they, as they were inherited from the 19th century and reinvigorated after 1945. As a point of entry in, into my discussion of power and legitimacy, however, I'd like to begin by talking a bit about a speech I attended 
uh, two nights ago at Humboldt University, which was given by Herman Van Rompuy, the president of the European Council. That is obviously the EU's assemblage of national heads of state and government. Ingolf Pernis, in fact, presided there as well, which is simply an indication of the fact that he moderates the talks of all the most important speakers who come through Berlin. <laughs> it was indeed a fascinating talk. Um, as much for what President Van Wampui did not say as for what he, in fact, did say. Uh, Van Wampui noted uh, how the Eurozone crisis over the last two years had seemingly forced the member states and national leaders to take the center stage, as he put it. And that for many observers, this raised fears of, of a renationalization of European politics. He was referring, of course, to the marginalization in the efforts to resolve the Eurozone crisis of the key supranational political institutions in the EU, the European Commission and the European Parliament, in favor of direct negotiations between national governments within the European Council, in which, of course, Germany, as Europe's paymaster, necessarily has played a major, some might even say hegemonic, role. Van Rompuy preferred to look on the brighter side of these developments. Rather than all this being a sign of the renationalization of European politics, he argued that it was in fact indicative of the deepening of what he called the Europeanization of national political life. He quoted Chancellor Merkel on, in this regard uh, when she said two weeks ago, in this crisis we have reached a whole new level of cooperation. We have arrived at a sort of European home affairs. Europa ist Innenpolitik. Europe is domestic politics. There can be no doubt that Europe has indeed uh, become uh, domestic politics in the member states. Although I would argue that the Eurozone crisis has merely accelerated a trend that began at least 25 years ago with the Single European Act of 1986 followed by the Treaty of Maastricht in 1992. It is no coincidence, as my book Power and Legitimacy points out, that concerns over Europe's purported democratic deficit began to intensify around this time. It was precisely in the late 1980s and then over the course of the 1990s that increasing numbers of Europeans became aware of how much regulatory power had in fact migrated to the supranational level in domains reaching well beyond market integration, such as in environmental policy or consumer protection. Even though the EU's uh, annual budget has remained minuscule, no more than 1% of total EU GDP, the European Union has become a prodigious producer of regulatory norms. Now, the estimates on this point uh, range wildly uh, from as low as 20 to as high as 80% of the norms now being applicable within the member states being of purported, purportedly being of EU origin. It really depends on who you ask. Uh, regardless of the total, however, the point is clear. Um, Europe has long been a part of major domestic policy making, if not also of domestic headline politics. There is, however, a problem with this so-called Europeanization of national political life, which was identified by Joschka Fischer, um, then Germany's uh, Joschka Fischer, excuse me, then Germany's foreign minister, in his own speech at Humboldt in 2000, in, in 2000, which is remembered for kicking off the debate over whether the EU needed a written constitution. Uh, an effort which ultimately failed, at least formally, although some might argue that elements of the goal were realized in the Treaty of Lisbon of 2009. According to Fisher in 2000, European governance has long, had long been afflicted and arguably still is afflicted by the broadly held sense that integration is largely, quote, a bureaucratic affair uh, run by a faceless, soulless bureaucracy in Brussels, close quote. That is, no matter how much European elites had struggled against this perception, European citizens continued and arguably still continue to experience the increasing Europeanization of domestic politics, if not precisely as a negation of democracy uh, on the national level, then certainly as the transfer of regulatory power to an unaccountable, distant, and ultimately foreign bureaucratic elite, which goes simply by the name Brussels or as the German writer Hans Magnus uh, Enzensberger put it in an essay last year, the Santis Monster Brussel, the gentle monster that is Brussels. The official response to this broad political perception toward the EU, beginning with the Single European Act in 1986 and continuing with every subsequent treaty up to Lisbon in 2009, 
has been to increase the role of the European Parliament in the supranational policy process to the point that today the European Parliament enjoys the right of co-decision in nearly all regulatory domains within the legal competence of the European Union. This effort, in fact, built on decisions of the European Court of Justice in the 1980s, which very much in keeping with the constitutionalist mindset uh, the court had established since the early 1960s, viewed the European Parliament as the expression of, quote, the fundamental democratic principle that the peoples of Europe should take part in the exercise of supranational power through the intermediary of a representative assembly, close quote. But this formal parliamentary democratization strategy, as I called it in an article I published in 1999, has ultimately failed to stem the negative perception of the EU as fundamentally bureaucratic and distant, as reflected in so-called Eurobarometer surveys, as well as low turnouts in European parliamentary elections. This is due, I would suggest, to the fact that the parliamentary democratization strategy is based on a fundamental misunderstanding uh, of what democracy is, as well as how true democratic legitimacy is in fact realized over time. To frame the discussion, and I'm not being particularly innovative here, uh, consider Lincoln's classic formulation in the Gettysburg Address. Democracy is government of the people, by the people, and for the people. Now I'm gonna take these elements out of order, discussing the second and third ones first, uh, for reasons that I hope will become clear in a moment. To begin with, um, to be democratically legitimate, one must have government by the people. That is government that involves popular participation, most importantly via elections. We could call this, as many have, input legitimacy. And the European Parliament clearly meets this criterion because it is, in fact, elected. It does, in fact, play a major role in legislation. And indeed, it also plays a key role in approving and supervising the European Commission. Um, the EU's supranational executive and also the body charged with formulating legislative proposals. Moreover, the Treaty of Lisbon attempted to increase the input legitimacy uh, in the EU by establishing a citizens initiative designed to augment participatory democracy whereby groups of citizens could uh, petition the European Commission to consider uh, a particular legislative proposal. Thus, given the extensive powers of the European Parliament, as well as the Citizens' Initiative, I would say there is little grounds to criticize the EU in terms of input legitimacy. And one could add, of course, obviously, that the heads of state and government sitting in the European Council and the Council of Ministers are also strongly legitimated, albeit on a national level. But in addition to input legitimacy, we must have government for the people. That is what the German political scientist Fritz Scharf has famously called output legitimacy. It exists where there is a sense that governing bodies promote, with some reasonable degree of success, the security and prosperity of their population. European elites have traditionally justified integration on this basis. Indeed, Herman Van Rompuy did so in his, in his Humboldt speech two nights ago, and I quote, legitimacy arises when people see, hear, and feel that a political order benefits their prosperity their freedom and security, and it safeguards their future, close quote. Although it should be added that he readily admitted that the Eurozone crisis was sorely testing this basis of legitimacy, at least in an economic sense. Uh, my own view is that uh, European integration over time has rightly earned a good deal of output legitimacy. This can be measured not merely in additional points added to net GDP as a consequence of market integration. Rather, it can also be measured by such things as the removal of border controls, the broadly shared respect for human rights and the rule of law, as well as perhaps most importantly, the overall sense of a peaceful coexistence that integration has brought to this historically dark continent. Peace, after all, was the stated aim of the Schumann Declaration in 1950. Thus, the EU has much to be proud of in terms of output legitimacy as well. So what then is the problem with the EU's democratic legitimacy? I would say the problem lies precisely in Lincoln's threshold criterion, government of the people. Government of the people refers to the historical identity between a population and a set of governing institutions. That is, it refers to the political cultural perception that the institutions of government are genuinely the people's own which they have historically constituted for the purpose of self-rule over time. Antecedent to this perception, however, is the perception 
of the existence of a people itself. That is, the sense that there exists a historically cohesive political community shaped by broadly shared historical memories in which it is legitimate for the, minority, for the majority to rule over the minority, subject, of course, to the protection of human rights. This perception of historical cohesion in turn gives rise to the belief that the political community is not merely capable of, but indeed entitled to, self-rule through institutions that they constitute for this purpose. This, I would say, is the cultural foundation of the ideal of representative government inherited from the 19th century. When a political community gains this historically grounded sense of democratic self-consciousness, it becomes a demos in the sense of demos gratia, that is, democratie or democracy. In other words, democratic legitimacy in the deepest sense depends not merely on democracy's inputs and outputs, rather it ultimately depends on whether there exists this crucial sense of historical identity between the institutions and the people. That is the sense that both the people and their institutions are indeed the product of the same common history, even a deeply contested history as in, for example, the United States. I would in fact argue that this sense of demos legitimacy is not merely essential to democracy but also to constitutionalism itself. And in this I follow the lead of Jed Rubenfeld in his 2001 book, Freedom and Time, A Theory of Constitutional Self-Government. It is on the basis of this demos legitimacy that merely functional institutions of rule are transformed into genuinely constitutional bodies because they have come to be understood as the institutional expressions of the right of the demos to rule itself. The EU today is riddled with multiple demoi across its various member states, which of course creates a great deal of democratic and constitutional legitimacy, not for the EU, but for national constitutional bodies. There are exceptions, of course, such as Belgium, where the coherence of the national demos is deeply contested, thus undermining the legitimacy and effectiveness, frankly, of national institutions. But as is broadly recognized throughout Europe, and again, no news here, the EU as yet lacks any single overarching European demos, and thus perhaps it also lacks, at least for the moment, the needed sociocultural and sociopolitical foundations um, for a pan-European democratic constitutionalism. Without such demos legitimacy, that is, without the sense that European institutions are genuinely the people's own, rather than some distant bureaucratic construct, Europe will have a great deal of difficulty overcoming its so-called democratic deficit, no matter how much input and output legitimacy otherwise exists. Indeed, the very idea of a democratic deficit may reflect an elite misapprehension of the nature of the problem. As my book, Power and Legitimacy, points out, the problem in the EU is not a democratic deficit in the sense of needing increased input legitimacy. Rather, the problem is one of democratic disconnect in the sense that EU institutions are generally perceived as beyond the control of democratic and constitutional bodies in a historically recognizable sense. Sympathetic European commentators, not to mention judges on the, uh, on the ECJ, have struggled mightily to reconceive the nature of democracy and constitutionalism in the European Union. They have come up with a whole range of network-based theories of transnational or cosmopolitan democratic and constitutional legitimacy in order to dissociate these concepts from the nation state and thus bring supranational governance within their conceptual ambit. And yet, the idea of the EU as democratic and constitutional in its own right has remained deeply suspect, at least when measured against the perceived legitimacy of the institutions on the national level with all their many flaws, and there are many. The result, in my view, has been a continuing disconnect, and here we get to the title of the book, between, on the one hand, the extensive scope of supranational regulatory power and, on the other hand, the limited capacity of supranational institutions to legitimize that power in democratic and constitutional terms which is something still demanded by the admittedly evolving ideals of self-government inherited from the 19th century and reinvigorated after 1945. 
Power and legitimacy argues that European public law has quietly and in some sense unconsciously attempted to overcome this disconnect by establishing over time a range of national mechanisms to oversee and legitimize supranational regulatory power in a democratic and constitutional sense. These mechanisms challenge the idea, widespread among legal scholars of integration, that European governance is built on a set of, quote, institutions constitutionally separated from national legitimation processes, unquote, as a recent scholarly article put it. These national legitimating mechanisms that I highlight in Power and Legitimacy include, of course, the well-known collective oversight exercised by national executives via the Council of Ministers and the European Council. This mechanism is indicative of the decisive role played by national executives under the post-war constitutional settlement as uh, the book explores in great detail. But these national oversight mechanisms also include judicial review by national high courts with respect to certain core democratic, constitution, democratic and constitutional commitments, the so-called competence, competence uh, jurisprudence, for example, which also reflects the critical role of courts under the post-war constitutional settlement. And finally, these mechanisms include the recourse to national parliamentary scrutiny of supranational action, particularly over the last two decades, whether of national executives individually, that is, by uh, committees within national parliaments, or of supranational bodies more generally, culminating in the new subsidiarity early warning mechanism of the Treaty of Lisbon. These national mechanisms exist, I would argue, to attempt to strike a balance. Whether they do so is another question. They attempt to strike a balance between the evident functional and political demands for supranational regulatory solutions and the continued attachment to the nation state as the primary locus of democratic and constitutional legitimacy in Europe. Put another way, these national legitimating mechanisms establish a framework within which the otherwise undoubted complexity of Europe's policymaking processes distributed across multiple levels of governance can operate without evident democratic and constitutional legitimacy of their own, at least as classically understood. So how then should we interpret these national legitimating mechanisms in legal and historical terms? This is the central question motivating my book, and I hope it is the principal value added of the book as well. My aim in power and legitimacy in some sense was to offer a legal historical theory to, de to, un to better understand the development of these national legitimating mechanisms as an integrated whole and as a response to the lack of demos legitimacy in the European Union. The traditional debate about the legal character of European integration has operated along a dimension stretching from international organizations at one end to a kind of quasi-constitutional federalism at the other end. The consensus view is that European supranationalism is sui generis. In some respects, it operates like a traditional international organization in which the sovereign equality of member states is respected and intergovernmental decision making prevails. But in other respects, it behaves like a quasi-federal constitutional entity in which supranational legal discipline greatly limits the sovereign prerogatives of member states and in certain domains at least, and frankly most domains now, uh, majority voting is used to produce norms for the EU as a whole. Power and legitimacy argues by contrast that the EU should be analyzed along a different interpretive dimension precisely as a consequence of this disconnect between regulatory power, and democratic legitimacy that I discern. That, my dimension, or the dimension that I propose, stretches from the strongly legitimated constitutional bodies on the national level, whether legislative, executive, or judicial, to the diffuse and fragmented forms of delegated regulatory power, whether located at the subnational, national, supranational, or even international levels. In this framework, therefore, both the EU and traditional international organizations are manifestations of the same phenomenon. That is, the diffusion and fragmentation of normative power away from the strongly legitimated bodies of the nation state over the course of the 20th century. From this perspective, the challenge of legitimizing EU governance is simply a new manifestation of an old problem. 
that of legitimizing administrative governance more generally, albeit now in a supranational rather than national form. It is for this reason that I argue that European public law is best understood in terms of what I call the post-war constitutional settlement of administrative governance. The key to understanding the legitimation of administrative governance in whatever form is, as Ingolf properly said, in my view, the concept of delegation. Although now obscured behind the language of conferral in the European treaties, the role of delegation is increasingly hard to ignore as a foundation normative principle in European public law, in which democratic and constitutional legitimacy remains fundamentally national, even as regulatory power is transferred to the European Union. Delegation, however, does not refer to some immutable rational choice regime in which constitutional principles, and here I'm using P-A-L-S, not P-L-E-S, in which I'm talking in principal agent terms. We have Karen Alter here. She can educate you all on that. That's, it's, it's in vogue within uh, the social sciences. It's an interesting and helpful uh, analytical framework. In which constitutional principles somehow control administrative agents? I challenge this view. We should not understand delegation in this sense. Um, unfortunately, some parts of the integration literature, when they see principal agent theory, they assume that the person is asserting that principles control agents. And that is wrong. If you know anything about administrative law, you would never make that assertion. It is a normative principle. To understand the relationship of delegation to modern administrative governance, we must dispense with an idealized understanding of a Westphalian constitutional principle, a Westphalian sovereign with unbridled power to direct regulatory outcomes within a particular territory which is an ahistoric reading of state sovereignty, if there ever was one. This caricature of the principal agent relationship is far from the actual historical reality, not just supranationally, but also nationally. Indeed, one of the most fascinating elements of the post-war constitutional sediment, explored in detail in power and legitimacy, has been the constitutional redefinition of uh, uh, constitutional redefinition of the power which must be retained in the legislature and the power which may be lawfully delegated to the executive and administrative spheres. In this sense, delegation has evolved as a highly flexible normative legal principle in which the power to control, whether de facto or de jure, is often greatly diminished, if not nearly relinquished entirely, legitimized by the belief that some matters are left to the autonomous decision making of administrative actors. Now, central banks are probably the most extreme example of this faith in the autonomous expertise of administrative actors. Um, but we don't have to go into that. Uh, constitutional principles, even at the state level, and again, I'm using it in the sense of P-A-L-S, constitutional principles have often settled for something less than actual control, perhaps merely supervision, coordination, or what an American administrative lawyer would call oversight. Along these lines, one could cite the transformation of the old notion of chancellor democracy in Germany, which, has, which some theorists now claim is best understood as a coordination democracy, in which the chancellor serves only as a policy manager at the center of a highly pluralist institutional network. In the case of European integration, this sort of co coordination or oversight by historically constituted bodies in the nation state most importantly national executives, but also by national high courts and increasingly by national parliaments, has provided or seeks to provide the necessary legitimating connection between the diffuse and fragmented agents of regulatory power in the European Union and the possessors of democratic and constitutional legitimacy in a historically recognizable sense, that is, in a national sense. This, in my view, is the essence of modern administrative governance the separation of regulatory power from the historically constituted bodies of the nation state, executive, legislative, and judicial, which in turn is legitimized through mechanisms of oversight by these same bodies, which thus seeks to reconcile the reality of diffuse and fragmented governance with the conceptions of democratic and constitutional legitimacy we inherit from the past. Viewing national legitimating mechanisms in European public law in this way is not just an analytical conceit on my part. Rather, as power and legitimacy argues in some detail, there is considerable historical evidence that each of the national legitimating mechanisms in the EU, executive, legislative, and judicial, 
um, were constructed with an eye to similar legitimating mechanisms in the administrative state and under the post-war constitutional settlement. In this regard, a particular interest to this audience may be the competence, competence, and constitutional identity jurisprudence of the German Bundesverfassungsgericht. This jurisprudence has drawn directly from its domestic counterpart regarding the constitutionality of delegation to executive administ and administrative bodies under the Basic Law of 1949. And I'm here I'm speaking here specifically of the jurisprudence interpreting Article 80, subsection 1. The Bundesverfassungsgericht has also drawn on the related Wesentlichkeitstheorie, and I'm, apologies for my German, Wesentlichkeitstheorie, or theory of essentialness, whereby the court has sought to protect what it believes to be the essential functions of the national parliament in the face of functional demands or political demands for the diffusion and fragmentation of regulatory power. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, this jurisprudence reflects elements that are clearly analogous to the so-called Vorbehalts des Gesetzes, or the domain reserved to legislation under the Constitution, which the uh, court has used to ensure the Bundestag's position in Germany's post-war system of separation of powers. This is the constitutional dimension of administrative governance on the national level. But it also must be stressed, consistent with the judicial role vis-a-vis -vis administrative action under the post-war constitutional settlement, that the broader approach of the German High Court, the broader approach of the German Federal Constitutional Court has been one of strong deference to the political choice in favor of integration, as well as to the discretion of decision makers charged with implementing that choice, whether national executives or supranational bodies like the European Court of Justice, even where individual rights are at stake. If it were not already clear to this point in my talk, let me make it as clear as possible now. I regard the post-war constitutional settlement of administrative governance as an historic achievement after the catastrophe of 1914 to 1945. The post-war constitutional settlement sought to define a workable balance between cultural ideals of representative government inherited from the 19th century and the diffuse and fragmented reality of administrative governance in the post-war welfare state. Thus, for me to argue, as I do in power and legitimacy, that European integration is administrative, not constitutional, and thus built on the post-war constitutional settlement of administrative governance is not to denigrate the process of European integration, as some readers might suppose. I'm often the caricatural footnote. Some people argue that the EU is administrative. This is a silly position, CEG Linseth. Um, in any event, <laughs> uh, I am not a Euroskeptic. I am not a Euroskeptic, which I hope I have made clear through my earlier discussion of the considerable achievements in European integration in terms of output legitimacy. With apologies to Ingolf, I am, however, a skeptic with regard to the so-called constitutional interpretation of integration, precisely because I believe such interpretations often wrongly bracket out the no demos problem and thus effectively assume, at least terminologically and maybe even sub substantively, a degree of autonomous legitimacy in the EU that is in fact fundamentally lacking, or at least is still fundamentally in dispute. If in describing the EU we are using the term constitution in a purely descriptive sense, to refer to the sort of organic statutes or bylaws that all organizations need to operate with some degree of legal certainty, then of course the EU has a constitution. But what the EU lacks and what the careless use of the term constitution in relation to the EU elides is the broadly shared sense that its institutions embody or express the capacity of a historically cohesive political community, a European demos, to rule itself through institutions historically constituted for that purpose. Assuming a degree of autonomous legitimacy in the EU by describing it as constitutional, I believe, is not merely to make a mistake as a matter of scholarly analysis. Rather, it is also potentially very risky because it invites profound errors of institutional and policy design, as the Eurozone crisis, I believe, is sadly proven. The events of the last two years suggest that the common currency was not just flawed economically, although economists never tire of pointing out that, countries, that the countries of the Eurozone, certainly Germany and Greece, do not constitute what they call an optimal currency area. 
Rather, my perspective is that of a comparative historian of public law and of administrative governance, which inevitably leads me to focus on the question of legitimacy. Like any form of essentially administrative governance, the EU is legitimate for certain purposes, but not others. Indeed, the Vorbehaltsdetzgesetzes, or the theory of essentialness, is an effort to define in law what, what kinds of questions appropriately belong to an administrative body and what appropriately belongs to a strongly legitimated constitutional body. Um, so the EU is legitimate for certain purposes, but not others, unless Europeans are prepared to change fundamentally their understanding of what democratic self-government means or where it is located. Thus, whenever we talk about the legitimacy of European integration, we must always ask the question, legitimate for what? Legitimate for what purpose? The flaw in the European Monetary Union from this public law perspective may be that given the downside risks that the Eurozone crisis is now revealing, the adoption of the Euro presupposed a degree of centralized political power and legitimacy most importantly relating to shared taxing and borrowing authority, Eurobonds, that the EU, or rather the Eurozone countries collectively, simply lack. Herman Van Rompuy in his speech two nights ago continually pointed to the fact that the total debt levels and the general fiscal position of the Eurozone as a whole were actually pretty decent, at least as compared to the United States or the UK. This is undoubtedly true. The problem with this claim is that the Eurozone as a whole, aside from the fact that it shares a common currency, along with common institutions like the European system of central banks, is otherwise a statistical artifact with no real political existence of its own, and certainly no shared taxing or borrowing authority that might be used to take advantage of the overall sound position of the Eurozone as a whole. Indeed, the German Bundesverfassungsgericht has made it quite clear in its several decisions arising out of the Eurozone crisis that Eurobonds are out of the question, precisely because they will impinge on the historical prerogatives and thus democratic and constitutional identity of the Bundestag. In short, the court believes that the removal of control over taxing and borrowing power that Eurobonds would inevitably entail would impinge on the realm of legislative power that must be reserved to the national parliament, akin to the Vorbehaltsdetzgesetzes in the post-war constitutional settlement. Thus, in response to the question of legitimate for what in European integration, the EU might be perfectly legitimate as a vehicle to harmonize regulatory standards in various domains, numerous domains. But it may not be legitimate to assume the power over the national purse in a way demanded, for example, by the Eurozone crisis. In other words, I think it deeply unlikely that a European Alexander Hamilton will emerge anytime soon, someone able, as a means of pulling the Eurozone out of its current crisis, to engineer an assumption of the debts of the member states on the supranational level, as Hamilton and the federal government did with state debts in the aftermath of the American Revolutionary War. Why? Because Europe lacks, as yet, the demos legitimacy, the sense of government of the people, to undertake such an extraordinary step. To close, I ask your indulgence by letting me read from the final paragraphs of Power and Legitimacy. If supranational institutions do eventually attain some autonomous capacity for self-legitimation, then Europe will have reached a point contemplated by Ernest Renan in his 1882, um, excuse me, in 1882 in his classic lecture, What is a Nation? Although Renan spoke there of nations, his meaning clearly extended to nation states, which he viewed as, quote, not something eternal. They had their beginnings and they will end. A European confederation will probably replace them, close quote. But as Renan continued in terms undoubtedly true for his era, such is not the law of the century in which we are living. The surprising lesson of the present study may be that Renan's caveat of 1882 retains more than a residual measure of validity in our own era. Despite all that has come to pass in the intervening century and a quarter, a constitutionally autonomous European polity has not yet eclipsed the nation state, at least not in law 
and almost certainly not in culture or political practice. It has been through the adaptation of the legitimating mechanisms and normative principles of the post-war constitutional settlement of administrative governance that Europe has arguably found its way pragmatically to an institutional formula that conforms to Europe's new slogan, united in diversity. Unity is achieved by way of shared institutions whose character is fundamentally administrative, creating nevertheless a deeply political system exercising some measure of delegated normative power on the supranational level, operating on behalf of a set of polycentric constitutional bodies on the national level. Diversity is preserved, however, precisely because ultimate legitimation, if not control, remains in the polycentric constituted bodies of self-government, executive, legislative, and judicial, of the member states. In this way, European public law has found a way to maintain the connection to the strong expressions of democratic self-rule on the national level in what is otherwise functionally a multi-level multi and even polyarchical system of governance. Such is the law of the age in which we are living. Different from Annals, no doubt, but surprisingly less so than one might suppose after reading the many fascinating but still ultimately doubtful reflections on the possible forms of democracy and constitutionalism beyond the state that have proliferated in Europe over the, re over the last two decades. Nationally grounded legitimating mechanisms in European public law remind us that constitutional democracy still emanates from the state in crucial respects. How long that will last, I cannot say. But at this point in Europe's history, these mechanisms are probably best viewed in terms that Ernest Renan would have well understood. They remind us that national institutions are looked upon in terms of political culture as what Renan called a guarantee of liberty in a collective constitutional sense, something that he said, quote, would be lost if Europe had only one law and one master. Thank you.